Never is elastic, it's very responsive. It changed a whole lot. So now the income has changed by 10%. What do you think this change? More or less. No? It's more or less. Why is it less? What do you mean of elastic? The income elasticity is elastic. Okay, let's think about the meaning of in income elastic. Elastic is elastic. Can you use a sentence to describe, inter interpret that meaning? Elastic means it's change a lot or change a small amount when it's elastic when it's elastic change a lot so it will be more because elastic if the income elasticity is elastic that means when the change price when the income changes your quantity demand is going to change a lot change a lot because then that means the consumer are responsive to that price change, and the consumers, you know, really react to that price change a lot. So elastic means the price, the income change will cause a bigger change in the quantity demand. So based on this information, you know this is going to be more than ten percent. Yes. But we still do not know the number, right? I want you to calculate the number. So how do we do that? In quantity demand, in income, right? This is the formula we learned. So income elasticity demand is equal to percentage change in quantity demand divided by percentage change in income. looking for here? We're looking for what will happen to the purchase of this. So in a sense, we're looking for the percentage change of this non fat ground beef. So we're looking for this, the numerator, right? Do you agree? We're looking for that. Do we know this percentage change in income? Yeah. What is it? Do we know the elasticity, the income elasticity? Yeah. What is it? Yeah. One, minus 194, right? Can you solve the numerator? Yeah. Okay, how do, how do you solve it? How do we solve that? Multiply, Multiply these two numbers together, right? So multiply them together, what do you get? Percentage change in quantity demand it will be equal to minus 194 multiply 10%, which is equal to what? 19.4%, that's it? That's it? Do we miss something? Do we negative? Yeah, that. So now we can answer this question. What, do, what will happen to the purchase of non-fat non ground beef? The purchase of non-fat ground beef is going to decrease because it's active here, right? It's going to decrease almost 20%. So the quantity demanded for the non-fat ground beef is going to decrease almost 20%. Okay, so in this question, I introduce you another way to utilize this elasticity. In this formula, there are three components, right? Knowing any other two values, you can solve the third one. Great. So in the My Econ Lab homework, you will see some of these questions. You are given two values, you know, and then you are asked to solve the third one. In this question, you're given this two, but maybe in the question in My Econ Lab, you're given this two, or maybe given this two. So you should know how to solve the third one by any by given you know by having 
on the add to values. Make sense on this one? So what's important is every time you get the information like minus 1.94, you ask yourself, what do I learn from this information? Okay, is it elastic or inelastic? What do we learn? Okay. Then from the negative positive sign you learn, what do we learn from this sign here? Because we know this income, income elasticity have two possible signs, right? Any other elasticity also have two possible signs. Cross, okay? Cross elasticity here. That also have two, two signs. Okay, so in that, in the mighty that formal, you're probably going to see some question on the cross elasticity. That would relate to whether the group accepts you or complements, because that would determine the sign of the problem. Okay, start homework early. Okay. And some of you probably, I don't know whether you can guess the answer. I guess you have two, more, two tries. You know, if you guess it twice right, you can get one. Don't do that. Because you didn't learn it. Really practice the concept. You know? The homework is really a given, a given credit, but you, know, you need to use it to uh, learn the stuff. Okay. Okay, any other questions or thoughts on this? Everybody's comfortable? Okay. okay, good. So now we're going to move on to the next chapter. Okay, so now we're going to get into the core of this class. This class. Okay, so the next um, next couple of weeks, I'm going to talk about the consumer theory. Okay, after consumer theory, we're going to talk about the producer theory. So these two parts are the main part of this. So uh, we're getting into the very important concept. What does this consumer theory? performing really well in your job, I'm going to increase your pay from $30 to $35 per hour. But you have to work 50 hours per week now instead of 40 hours. Should you do it? Will you do it? Somebody will shift you. Somebody will see you. Another kind of decision. One day you will have a child. For example, you just have this child born. You want to send the child to college, to a really nice college, like you know, my MIT or Yale, you know, in 18 years. And you better save money right now. How much should you put it aside for the, for the child's college fund? That kind of decision. So in this chapter, we're going to talk about the rationales behind those decision making. So how do you make those decisions? And how can we, how can this course help you understand the rationale behind all these decision makers? Mm -hmm. So that's why this is uh, the core of this course. It deals with individual decision making. So in this chapter, I'm going to introduce you some very simple framework, simple models. On the surface, it may seem very unrealistic, but the simple framework can be very powerful. 
without you, you know, the, the driving force behind the decisions. Okay, so the last three examples I just talked about, the decision on whether you purchase this pizza, which is on sale or not, whether you should um, accept that offer that made by your employer, or how much should you save, you know, for your child to go to college in the future. Okay. Those decisions happen in different markets. Think about the first example I gave you. How, whether you should buy that pizza, which is not sell now. What market are we talking about? What kind of decision is it? So what kind of role you play in that decision? Hmm? It's not a tricky question. you consumer, right? The role you play in that decision making, it's your consumer. And you demand there in that market, right? So in the first example is what we talk about is in the market, goods market. And in that market, you demand there. That's the role you play. You want to decide, you know, how much you're going to buy, how much you're going to consume. So in that goods market, you do demand there. So you play a role in the goods market as individual. Now, think about the second example. Your employer is going to raise your hourly salary, you know, from $30 to $35. You got to decide whether you want to work for 50 hours instead of 40. What kind of role you play there? What kind of market do we talk about there? Huh? In the labor market, right? That's no longer a goods market, it's in the labor market. And what kind of role you play there? Are you still, are you a demander or something else? In the labor market, what are you? What do you do in the labor market? You know it. Huh? Worker. In the labor market, you work. You provide your labor. You supply your labor, right? So are you demand or supplier? You supplier. So you have your role has changed in that market. From goods market to labor market. In the labor market, you're supplier. So you see you perform different roles in the different market. like you know we switch those you know on a daily basis you know we go home the daughter or son and then when you're here you're a student you know you change jobs okay so that's the second market second role you play what's the third example I give you Ooh, somebody remember you really pay attention okay you want to save money for your for your kids to go to college in 18 years. So what kind of market we're talking about there? What kind of role you place there? It's a labor market? It's a goods market? It's a What is it? If you just say, put on, put in a bank right now, I don't want one percent is nine, that is still like some percent. You're not going to accumulate much money, right? If you just put in your savings account. So you probably want to uh, invest this fund, right? You know, buy some, um, there is this, uh, in our retirement account is Tearcraft, and there is, uh, there is a category, actually, you can save your money in. You know, you put your money into that account, and uh, actually it has to be after tax, okay? You put in your money, and then you choose a portfolio that will invest it for you. So after, you know, a number of years, you can get it out, and you don't have to pay any tax on that. And uh, I forgot what the name of that, okay? So, so nowadays, people do not use a savings account to save. 
they have a lot of other options to accumulate wealth, to invest, to earn, you know, and the earnings, you know, in a number of years. So what are we talking about? What is the market for? Investment market? Yeah, capital market, investment market, right? So what is decision? The decision on investment, just like you said. So what is the kind of role you play in that capital market? She just, she just said that word. Investor. We invest. Okay. So in the third market we're talking about, it's capital market. So in those three different markets, you perform different roles. Okay. And in each different market, and your decision is somewhat different. The rationale is slightly different, okay, but they share similarities. Okay. So that's what we're going to talk about this this chapter. We're going to talk about how you make a decision in each of these markets. Good market, labor market, and capital market. You will start understanding what is the rationale behind, behind every one of the decisions. Remember at the beginning of class I told you this is the decision science. This teach you to make you understand, make you aware how you make decision on a daily basis. Even you know like the decision whether you want to sit here, listen to me now. It's a decision. And it's built on, it's based on this microeconomic principle. Okay. So we're gonna start with this. We're gonna start with very common and one. The, good, the decision in the good market because you you purchase goods every day you know you buy meals you buy water you know and uh, you go to movies so you, you consume all the time so that's the decision we deal with constantly so that's what we're going to focus on in this chapter and uh, in the labor market you guys probably are not you know some of you working on campus right okay you are working so you perform no there. But you know, and not until you really go into the labor market, you won't get a full-time job, you know, and uh, that decision not be as important as your decision on in the gold market. Okay, and for the capital market, you know, your student, you know, I, I, you know the student cannot have a lot of money, so really that decision probably has not come to you uh, at yet. Okay. Yes. Okay. Just okay. yes, you guys have started. I started mm -hmm. investing. Good, good. Mm -hmm. For that same reason. For the College. same. For the for kids, right? Yes. Okay. Good. Yeah, we need to think, think. You know, plan ahead, think early. Yeah. All right. Okay. So let's talk about the first one today. Okay. We're not gonna finish. We're going to do it the next uh, next week as well. So basically, in this market, the decision is. How do you spend your money, and what to buy, and how many units to buy? Okay, so that's a decision. How to spend your money, and what to buy, and how many to buy. What will extend those decisions? Okay, go to grocery store. You have this a hundred dollar cash, and you want to buy something, and you pick and choose. You determine in that hour. You determine how many you need to buy on this, how many you need to buy on that. So what is the rational behind that? Why I do not want to go to buy that, you know, two pizza to get third one free? Okay. Why would you do it? So a lot of lots of uh, principles. Principles. Okay. So what I am going to rely, we're going to rely on to explain those kind of decisions. I'm going to introduce you a model, a simple framework. Okay. <coughs> But in this simple framework, there's two elements. So I want you to guess what are these two crucial elements in this decision, in your decision of um, what to buy and how many to buy. What are the crucial elements? It does not have to be right. I just want you to think. Price. The price is important. Why is price is important? Because 
because you have limited income, right? So the first crucial element is the budget part. So that influences your decision. So the first element is budget. So that's the first thing. So that's going to influence your decision on what to buy and what and how much to buy. What do you think the second element? In this simple work, we just two elements. We just and making sure what the second element. In addition to your constraints, any constraints, we understand that also play a big role in your decision on what to be buy and how to buy. Is how much satisfaction you're gonna gain from consuming this good, right? And how much satisfaction? Some people, a lot of you are probably like a beer. You drink, you know, six pack of beer. If you're really happy, you gain satisfaction. So the second element, in economic terms, we call it utility. This is not utility like water, electricity, you know, gas. It is not, OK? This means your satisfaction from the consumption. So economy, economists summarize the crucial element in your decision making into these two things. One is your budget, budget constraint. The second one is how much satisfaction you gain from that group. With the knowledge of these two elements, two components, then we can analyze how you're going to make this decision. You know, we spend money, we buy things because we want to, we want to enjoy. We want to gain that satisfaction. You go on a vacation, you come back, you feel really satisfied. It gives you some beauty in you know? You hung out with your friends, you had a really good time. You gain utility from that activity. Satisfaction. Alright, so now let's look at budget constraint. How do we uh, construct budget constraint? Well, let's use a very simple example. Okay. Use me as an example. It's always fun to use the instructor. Suppose I have an income which is one hundred dollars to spend per week. Actually, not per week. Let's just. I don't want to sound like I spend a lot of money. So let's make it like a month. Okay, I have one hundred dollar a month to spend on some activities I enjoy. One activity I really enjoy is dining out. There is a restaurant, that is Thai restaurant in Pine here, in Southern Pine, which I really enjoy. I go there occasionally, you know. I don't want to cook for myself. And so I enjoy Thai meals. Let's see, that's one good. I will use this one. It's about $20 per meal, including tips, everything. Okay. Food is no longer cheap anymore. <laughs> I, I think I used 15 years ago. I came to United States 15 years ago. And uh, the gas was $1.00 and cents, something like that. Then a bunch of free stuff in the grocery store. When you go to a meal, you know, you spend ten dollars, you got so much stuff you can share with another person. It's no longer that case after fifteen years. However, the salary has not increased. It may actually go down. Our purchasing power has really decreased quite a bit in the last fifteen years. I observed this. I really observed it. Anyway. Okay, so that's one thing I enjoy. You know, eating time meals cost me thirty dollars. How many time meals I can have within a month based on that limited income, limited budget? 
five, right? Okay. Another activity I really enjoy is ballroom dance. I do ballroom dance. And the studio I go to, there is a, a ballroom dance party that student teacher who can go there, practice dancing, ballroom dancing. I enjoy that. And it's $10 each time you go to. The ticket is $10 each. Okay. So, let's say, you know, dance. Dance party. $10 each. Who many I can... I can go to dance party if I can, right? Okay. Let's assume that I have this $100 and I'm only going to spend on these two activities. Okay. So we have income, we have two goods, goods or services, you know, we want to consume, and we have the price for each good or each service we only consume. With this information, we're able to construct budget constraint. So that's a necessary element in a budget constraint. Income, the price of the two goods. Okay? So what we're going to do here is, the model we're going to do here is, we're going to use I to represent the income. And we use good X represent the number of X consumed. Y represent number of Y consumed. Okay, so let's say you know high new will be good X. Dance party will be good Y. X represent number of time meals I, you know, I enjoy each month, and Y represent number of dance party I go to each month. Okay. Right. And we use P X represent the price of good X, and P Y represent the price of good Y. So we use those symbols. Why we use those symbols? Because in this example, I gave you this time meal, this dance party, but sometimes, you know, we do not know what goods we're talking about, but we still want to use a framework. So that's why because we use those symbols to represent those. Okay. Now I want you to tell me, if I, if X and Y represent the number of each good, that will make me spend all this money on. So there's nothing left. I spend all this money on, on these two goods. And X, Y represent those numbers, those combinations. You guys with me here? For example, you know, if I have one time meal within a month, I will have $80 left, and Y would be eight, eight, right? Yes? Okay. So one eight would be a, a set that satisfies this uh, limited income. So let's say X, Y, you know, and other numbers where I consume all the money, I spend all the money. Three and four. Huh? Three and four. Three and four? Yes. Yeah. And four, if there's a four, will be two, right? We have a lot of different combinations. So how do we use a mathematical relationship using this to describe the relationship? We want to spend all the income on these two goods. These two represent the number of each good we can consume. And what would be the mathematical relationship among these variables? You guys know what I'm talking about? Make like an equation or something? Yeah, the equation. I equals... I equals... Um... Dx... Dx... Yeah. Times x. Times x. That is the 
when you spend on x, right? Plus, Plus py times y. That's it. This is our budget constraint. So this tells you that how many x, y you are able to buy when you spend all your income. So in this example here is 100 equal to 20x plus 10. That's the mathematical equation. That's the budget constraint we talk about. Okay, so now we know how do we construct this mathematical budget constraint. Now I want to put it on a graph. Put this x and y on the graph. Who can tell me what is the number here, what is the number here? Is it going to be a straight line? Is it going to be a straight line? Yes, because x, y has a linear relationship. So it's going to be a straight line. This is going to be a straight line. So, and also you know it's probably going to look like this way. You need to determine here what is y here. Okay. Is equal to what? 10. Is equal to 10, right? Yeah. Because if this tells you that if I is equal to 0, which means if you don't buy any kind of meals, how many parties you can, I can go to? 10 parties. What is the number here? Five. Five? Oh, five, yeah. Right? You're dividing. Five. Okay, exactly. yeah. You're dividing. Five. Everybody's with me here? Yeah, I get it now. Yes? Five? Where you get five from? She's getting how many times the X and Y would go into 100. This number here on the Y axis, uh, remember this is a dance party. And this is a high meal. So if you're looking for the number on here, so that means you don't go, I don't go to dance party. I just spend money on time meal. If I have $100, the time meal costs $20 per meal, totally I can go to five. This is a five. So this represents maximum amount of the dance party I can go to. Okay, so this represents the maximum amount of the dance party I can go to. Okay, so this represents the maximum of the dance party I can go to. Then after that, you just snap this, right? And this represents that. Let me ask you one thing. I'm going to pick a combination inside this. What does this power point indicate? Do you have some money in your pocket? You have some money left. You're not spending all your income. How about here? about the PPF, production possibility from here, right? It is like a borderline between the possible and impossible. So anything beyond this, we're going to call it budget line. Anything beyond here is impossible. It's beyond you affordability. You cannot afford it. But anything here, you're going to have some money left. From here. Now we want to analyze this budget line slope. Where do we find the slope of this budget line? Look at this number. This is easy to find. What's the slope? Minus. You guys have a problem with slope, right? Finding the slope. How do we find slope? Do we go over this, you know, for the PPF stuff? This is 10, this is the 5, what's the slope? Two. Two. Minus 2, minus 10 divided by 5. That's how, that's how we find the slope. Use this number divided by But 
if I do not give you this number here, 10 and 5, I just tell you, dance party is $10 each. Time you is $20 each. So I give you PX and PY. How do you find the slope? So without drawing this graph, that's what I give you, PX and PY. How do you find the slope? PX divided by PY. Please remember this formula here. That's the slope of the budget line. It's minus Px divided by Py. Okay, now I'm going to tell you. You know, this month I've been working really hard, so I decided to award myself, reward myself. So I told myself, you can spend $200 on this tour. But the price of dance party and, and also the time will remain the same. Now I want to ask you, this is my body, this was my body line, right, earlier. Now how my body line is going to change? Now right now instead of 100, I have $200. The time meal still cost $20 each, dance club, still cost $10 each. How this will, how my budget will change? change it's going to spend that way. Is it going to expand the peril or not? What determines, what determines by this peril? Is is parallel? What does it mean? If the price changes, it's what you're saying. If it's parallel, it means the slope is same, right? What determines the slope? The price of the two goods. Do the price of two goods change? So does the slope change? So if I have more money, I decide to reward myself more money. But the goods, the price of two goods remain the same. Then budget line is going to shift in parallel. So here I'm going to have 20 units. Here I'm going to have 10. But the slope remains the same. So income does not change the slope of budget line. Yes? Everybody is getting this? Yes? Now, let's say the income does not change. I still want to just keep in within the $100 range. But actually, my dance studio has increased the price of that dance party from $10 to $15. And actually, that's true. It is true. The Thai restaurant, uh, the prices still remain the same. but. You can notice this, the amount is slightly smaller because they have to accommodate, you know, the, the increasing price of the all inputs, all ingredients, right? If they want to maintain the same price, attract the same amount of customer, they have to do some cut corners in other parts. So, but you know, the, the restaurant meals remain the same, but the ballroom dance party does increase from ten dollars to fifty. So now. How should we change my budget line? Income is still 100, time meal is still $20, but dance party has increased from 10 to 15. Okay. So, first, do you think the slope now is going to change? Yes. Because one of this is different now, right? So I want you to think about how this budget line is going to be different. How are we going to change that? 
This is dance party. This is time here, right? I'm gonna lead you to the answer. You have to be with me. One hundred dollar remain the same. High meal price still twenty dollar free. Go on. Does this one change? Are you sure? Yes. Sure. Yes. You will have one hundred dollars. The Thai meal is still twenty dollar per meal. Still, the maximum amount of meal you can enjoy is five. You say, right? How about this? No. This one is going to be low. Now you cannot have hand dance party. So this pose is going to be shaped. That's how your budget line shifts. From one of the good price is different. You guys see how it changes? And if I did, I did not change the dance party price, I changed the time meal price, you know this point is going to change, right? But if I change the rules, now we'll make the problem more complicated, right? <laughs> but I don't want to uh, overcomplicate the problem at this point. But you understand what I mean, how do we change it? Okay, good, perfect. So we have finished the concept budget line and um, today is Wednesday, right? So we don't have to have class on Friday. And I'm gonna sign up for today and we'll see you.